Well, hello, and welcome back to The Lamp Post Listener. My name is Daniel. I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we usually read one chapter of the Chronicles of Narnia. But today, however, Phil and I are joined by Sean and Jordan from the Lesser Known Lewis podcast. And we're going to be discussing Jack's essays and learn more about their show. So, gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. And to clarify, the name of their podcast is Lesser Known Lewis. Yes. <laughs> they are not the lesser known <laughs> podcast. Yeah, they're not the lesser known Lewis podcast. Well, I mean, at this point, we podcast. feel like it. We're just starting out, so it's fine. <laughs> We're the getting to yeah. be known Lewis podcast. <laughs> Right. Yes. <laughs> we we had that kind of this running gag on the show now that we started out as Narnia novices, but we have clearly surpassed at least being novices. We're not calling ourselves experts, but novice doesn't feel quite appropriate. So we're the Narnia uh, intermediates at this point. So eventually yeah. you can retitle your podcast, you know, the, the slightly more known Lewis. Love it. It's exciting to have you all on. Your show has been came on the scene a little over a year ago now at this point, And has been wonderful. Y'all are in your second season at this point. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And it's just been a, a great blessing to a lot of people. But I'd love to spend, I don't know, the first little bit of time here in this episode, letting our listeners get to know y'all a little bit more and hear about what it is that y'all do on the Lesser Known Lewis podcast. So, uh, Jordan, maybe just start by telling us a little bit about your podcast. Maybe what's the format and what's the purpose? Why are y'all doing this? I guess the purpose is to essentially do what you guys are doing with Narnia, but with C.S. Lewis's essays. And we decided to do this about a year ago because we happened so we happened to be friends. I don't know if that's the right way to say that. Sean and I are friends, <laughs> and we happened to find out that we were both reading Lewis's essays around the same time mm -hmm. and loving them. And we both had this. Um, inkling pun intended that yeah. uh people need to read these essays more than they do because you read when you if you love lewis you read narnia screw tape mere christianity and then you go from there and branch out more into his fiction maybe some headier works like miracles or the problem of pain but very few people will read many of his essays there's a few that are really popular, and we're going to cover those even though they're not technically lesser known, like The Weight of Glory or uh, Learning in Wartime, some of those ones. Mm -hmm. But there are there's like a collection of about 130 to 200 essays that Lewis wrote that you can buy uh, that have been published since in different anthologies. Sometimes you can get them almost all together. But we've been reading through these, and we love what he's saying in them and there's so much gold in them that people don't seem to know about because as Erebus says in Horse and His Boy, who, well, I'm paraphrasing now because I don't have a quote in front of me, but who wants to read the essays? Nobody wants to read the essays. Everyone yeah, yeah. loves stories. Yep. And Sean and I found ourselves wanting to read his essays and thinking they're actually really important. There's stuff in them that is very timely for today. And um, so we just, yeah, the format is we will have read, uh, similar to your podcast, we'll have read the essay beforehand, we'll talk about it throughout the podcast and reflect on what we found important about it, especially to both of us are Christians. And so we reflect a lot on what does this mean for our Christian lives? And how does this point us to mm -hmm. Jesus? But so much of it has to do with what is going on in the world today? And how does Lewis apply to that? Excellent. And I think there was, there was something about it. I heard recently about a, a list of books. I think Sean asked you for your top five books and you asked, can they all be by C.S. Lewis? Yeah. <laughs> and then he, he said that he has also been reading a lot of the essays. Is that close to what yeah, happened? Yeah, that's how the, the conversation went. Uh, he, Sean, Sean, I think you're reading an essay. Well, and I just think, that, yeah, I, I was, uh, I, I was listening to an audio book and, uh, it was a, it was a collection of C.S. Lewis. This is just so, this is niche. This is like inception is what's happening. Yeah. It was an essay collection about Lewis writing about essays and reading. <laughs> so, oh, wow. so it was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, an anthology that somebody had put together. It was just like a two hour audio book. And I was, I was listening to it and I thought, man, this is really good. And, and that was what got me kicked off. And, and yeah, like you said, then. Jordan and I, uh, we were chatting. I remember the the drive, like I was I was driving somewhere for work, and 
and uh, we were just connecting as friends and and yeah the rest was history and I would say that being pushed to just kind of steadily read these essays has been great for me again like even the word essay is a bit of a snooze like no one no mm-hmm. one want like yeah. the lesser appreciated Lewis the you know, the lesser exciting Lewis we could have called this but it's just not you know so the same way that when yeah. you're in Narnia and he puts these these phrases or these experiences in just a little snapshot of story, like a, a single chapter, like what you guys do, it can actually stand on its own because he just packs so much detail into every chapter. He actually does that in his essays. Like I, I would just call Lewis like a master of metaphor and simile and, and, um, and, and that's what really makes them really alive, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. You know, with that in mind, I think what's interesting for so many readers of the Narniad or maybe just Lewis's fiction in general is that I think a lot of people don't even know that this part of Lewis exists. We had um, uh, Jason Baxter on the show not too long ago, and he called this like the third version of Lewis, kind of the more academic version. And Lewis also is writing some apologetic and a lot of religious things too. But the S's, I think, really highlight his his way of writing, you know, the way that he can use words in a um, a nonfiction sense that we don't always see, obviously, in his imaginative writing. If if any of our listeners or just readers in general are only listening to or reading the imaginative works, what are they missing out on? What are some of the things that you really can only see in Lewis's essays? Well, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where maybe you're reading a book. It can be any kind of book or you hear a, a folktale, uh, a myth. You watch a movie and you sit down with somebody who really gets story really well. And you're having a conversation about your, this, this movie, the show that you, I mean, it can just be a TV show. It can be whatever. Mm-hmm. And they say, Hey, did you understand this reference? You know, they throw out, Oh, did you get this Easter egg? Or did you, did you get what the author was trying to say when he or she said blank? And it's just one of those things that it fires you up and you suddenly realize, oh my gosh, there's, there's like so much more depth in this narrative than I realized. Um, I would say that feeling where you have those epiphany moments in a conversation, that's what it feels like to read the essays of C.S. Lewis. Where what he is packing behind the scenes in his fiction, and you know, you call them his imaginative works, what he packs into his imaginative works, he says explicitly in prose, Um, in his essays. Mm. He says, this is how I think, and this is why I think we should think this way. And this is how we, I arrived at this, at this conclusion. So, so I would, I would even say that reading Lewis's essays for me has taught me how to think better and, and to think Mm. about like myself, um, how to think about certainly literature and story. um, And that's the season that we're on right now. We're just, just getting into talking about Lewis's perspectives on myth and storytelling and um and but faith and and um and uh, i don't know joy suffering death all these kinds of things that uh, that that you would maybe find lived out in a story is is explicit in the essay yeah i would have said the same thing i think because there's there's an essay we're going to cover um later this year called meditations in a tool shed oh yeah and, and there yeah. lewis talks about these two ways of knowing you can think about something, you can look at it, or you can experience it, you can look along it. And Lewis seems to write whatever he wants to write about, he seems to find a way to write in both versions. He writes something that you can experience that idea, uh, and lots of that's just fiction. And then he writes in ways that you can look at that same idea. And so some of it you just divide into his nonfiction or fiction works, but the essays largely fit into the category of nonfiction. However, because of how good Lewis is as a writer, he's using metaphor yeah. and analogies mm-hmm. all the time so that you can experience mm-hmm. the idea as well. And so like Sean said, it's not, they're not, the prose isn't boring at all. The essays aren't boring. And so there's that, uh, like Sean was also saying, there's this quote I was thinking of from, I think it's out of the silent planet where Lewis writes that you can't, you can't see a thing until you know what you're looking at. Hmm. And so if you love Narnia or his other fiction, it's, it's just like what Sean's saying. You, you can read it and experience something and you, you catch things and you'll even experience it at a deep level in ways that you might not 
know you're experiencing or, or seeing, but then you read when he writes about it in prose and he's looking at it and helps you think through it directly. And then you go back to the fiction and now you can see the thing better because you know what it is you're looking at. Right. I've, I feel like I've experienced this with reading something that is set in real history, but is a fictional account of something that was happening at the same time. And then wanting to go and read maybe the Wikipedia article to get a sense of what was happening historically. And then that Wikipedia article has sources and then going to those sources and totally, and then watching as everything becomes interconnected. And it is really helpful to have a bullet point of these are the major parts of this conflict that happened and here are the dates that they happen. And it makes the, it amplif- both things amplify each other. Yeah. So you now have this fictional story that is even, it's even more likely to be appreciated because of the craft that placed it in this time in history. But then also that story showed me something about history that I hadn't heard of or I didn't fully understand. And then this also it sets the stage for later on when you're reading something else, maybe something that came right after or right before. And I read several fictional works that were set right before each other. And so like reading something set in kind of like 1913, 1917 Russia, but then reading Anna Karenina right after that, Mm. and then seeing how we're setting the stage for what this other book did. And then that also got me excited about just what was actually happening. Like here's the fictional account, but what else was actually happening? Totally. So y'all just aired your second season finale back in May, but um, your first season was focused on what I think y'all called them the timely essays, right, of Lewis, kind of thinking about our current cultural context. And what's so ironic about this for y'all's first season, right, was the fact that Lewis was so incredibly focused on the medieval and Renaissance world, right? He was always, I mean, you think about that in uh, De Descriptione Temporum, right? He's talking about, like, he's a dinosaur. He lives in the past. And yet, for y'all's first season, you went back to these works, some of them 70, some of them 80 years old, and you said, we think these works, these words are timely for us today. So tell me a little bit about why. Why do you think his words are so timely? And what about Lewis makes his ideas and his writing, what makes his wisdom last? It's a good question. And I had to think about it. Why, why do I think that he's worth reading? And why do I, I mean, when you read him, you just go, oh yeah, no, this is, this is timely. It's important for now still. You get mm-hmm. it. But why is that? Why does it seem to be so consistent with Lewis? And I think Lewis's popularity still uh, attributes to that. He, he must be still worth reading if we're still reading him. Mm-hmm. I think it's for a couple of reasons. The first being he was first trained as a philosopher and that was his his first mm-hmm. passion, his first pursuit for a vocation. And so he is uh, educated in the wisdom of all ages, right? Up until mm-hmm. his day. And then his second passion or, or second pursuit vocationally was as an English literature professor, specifically of the Renaissance period. And then because... Of that, he dove deep into the 16th century of English literature. And I've heard it said that he read everything written in English in the 16th century and everything that they translated into English in the 16th century, which is just mind boggling. But for those two reasons alone, I find it very interesting because he's, he's a trained philosopher, which means he's been paying attention to what's been written about life and reality and wisdom throughout all ages. And then he dove deep into the Renaissance period and especially the 16th century, which is the century where more modernity really got its roots. And then he's also writing at the earliest um, couple decades of the 20th century, which is when post-modernity really started taking off and, and developing. And so here we have someone trained in the wisdom of all ages and also 
knowing very well what happened at the beginning of modernity and then writing at the beginning of post-modernity. And now we are just living out the fruits of all those things. Yeah. And, and he's just all his wisdom, all his insight, all his perspectives are so important and, and insightful because of those reasons. That's what he's paying attention to is, is the things that we're now seeing the fruit of, I think. But then also because he just, he's such a clear writer. Like you, I mentioned, you know, philosophy and English literature and my eyes immediately gloss over. I'm like, tell me something that matters for my life. I don't like, (laughs) I don't care. I'm probably not going to understand it if you're talking about those things because, uh, because I'm a postmodern and I'm a, a millennial who's, who can't be bothered to read a book very often. But because Lewis is such a good writer and a clear writer, he is able to communicate philosophy and perspective and help us see the things that we would uh, miss, I think, a lot of the times and, and not see. He helps us go below the, below the surface, I think. Yeah, uh, and, and I, I, teach, um, I, che- I teach church history at the college here and... Um, one of the things that I always tell my students at the beginning of it is um, there's nothing so much like the future as the past. We are we're good. born in an age where we, we think that what, for whatever reason, the, the things that we're facing are unique and they've only ever happened yeah. now. And, and we are obsessed with what's novel and we have really bad historical amnesia. That's actually why I was really excited to hear that you've been reading historical fiction. I actually think that's one of the best ways to learn history because it, history yeah. is is a story, even though you may not, you know, in, depending on what you're reading, like and I, I'm the exact same. Like I'll read something that's very loosely historical, maybe not quite like mm-hmm. Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer, you know, a historical, but, <laughs> but something. A step above. Yeah, that. a step above that, right? <laughs> like whatever, whatever the next degree is. Um, yeah, yeah. the, the tree houses of horror episodes on the Simpsons where they're dealing with something historical, there that's go. what yeah, I, yeah. but no, where <laughs> it's like, uh, you read that stuff and it actually puts it all in context of a story. And, and we, with this historical amnesia that we live with today, just naturally think that whatever happened before, um, there was kind of like almost this determinism, like it must have happened that way. But the people living through those moments, they had to think really deeply. They lived in the same level of uncertainty that, that we do or, or like feeling of being lost and confusion and all these different kinds of things. And Lewis, for his time, like in the midst of World War II, you know, mere, mere Christianity, he's delivering these messages on the radio and and um, and uh, being a World War One vet and, you know, all the other things that Jordan talked about, like philosophically standing on the edge of one age and to mm-hmm. another. He looks back and he says, hey, Actually, humanity has lived through this before. Actually, let's just bring all the treasure from the past into the into the present. I'm going to articulate it for you in a new way, and and I would say that's what keeps him evergreen. That first season that we did, that is uh, you know timely. We constantly keep finding. It's like should we do another timely season? Because maybe they're all timely. Maybe the problem is yeah. this whole. Mm-hmm. This could be ta- mm-hmm. called the timely Lewis podcast. You know, like, the whole thing <laughs> is the whole thing is timely. So. I think more so we should, I heard this thing the other day, there's a bit of a rabbit trail, but I read that um, thrift stores in the UK are no longer accepting Dan Brown novels. Now, I don't know if that was just clickbait (laughs) or what, but the reason is, is because we just printed so many of them and they had a list is like, oh yeah, Danielle Steele is on the list and all these like kind of mass market paperback um, popular novels. Nothing wrong with those things necessarily. I think they said that Fifty Shades is the next one up, so they're not gonna they're not gonna re- yeah, <laughs> accept gonna any of those because we just produce so much now. And uh, yeah. Lewis said, like, if a book isn't worth reading more than once, it's not worth reading at all. Absolutely, yeah. And and so I think there's this thing about how a lot of of what we look back on that we have like from ancient sources. Um, is worth reading again and again because it stood the test of time. It was produced in a time probably where there were many, many stories that didn't make the cut. But everything that's being produced mm-hmm. now that's contemporary hasn't stood the test of time enough to say, is this going to make the cut or not? But Lewis has absolutely made the cut, so I think he's worth any generation listening to. Okay. Yeah, Sean, I think about, I hear this so many times too, and I try not to to cringe too much when I hear it because I don't know that a lot of people saying it I'm not trying to say this is this makes you sound like I'm some enlightened guy that has figured that's not at all what I mean maybe I've heard people talk like this where 
I'll be making small talk with someone like, yeah, what, what content are you consuming right now? Like, what are you, <laughs> what, what, and what they're really just simply asking, they're making small talk and they're saying like, what are you into? They're just trying, it's the same way you might ask like, what do you do for a living? But even just the terminology of what content do I consume? It's this, it's the kind of thing that I think would make Jack shudder because the idea is that it's this, it's, yeah, it's just consumption. It's not something to engage with. And whether it's stories or books or, you know, whatever it is, it still has this like, I'm going to use it and then kind of throw it away. And I think a lot of the way that we engage with stories today is kind of that from that perspective. And it's because we've often, we've lost sight of why things are good to do more than once. That kind of monotony that Lewis talks about, God can say to the sun over and over again, you know, rise. He revels in that monotony mm. that we just, as as postmodern, struggle with. And it even makes me think of, too, you know, even the, the question I asked you all when I say, you know, what about our current cultural context? Which I, I use that, that phrase and terminology, but it's, it's kind of even myself when I say it, I go, well, I wonder if Lewis would, and not that he's perfect and and we have to agree with him on everything. Right. But I do wonder if it's the kind of thing that he'd be like, why would you even ask that question to begin with? Right. Like, doesn't that, that question carry with it some chronological snobbery yep. as if what we're facing today for some reason needs any kind of, you know, particular focus. I was, um, just a few weeks ago, I was down in Texas speaking at this conference, and I actually got was speaking a little bit on Lewis, but at the same conference was uh, Dr. Lewis Marcos from Houston Christian University, mm -hmm. done a lot of great work on Lewis, and he was actually speaking, though, on early heresies in the church, mm -hmm. so kind of pre-Nicene heresies in the church, and he, as he's talking about this, one of, the, one of the things he said that really stood out to me uh, and is he said something along the lines of, any any modern heresy, he's like, it's I, again. I don't remember the exact way he said it. But it's like it's it just shows that that heretic hasn't read history because that yeah. that heresy has already been proven false yeah. and it was proved false thousands of years ago. Yeah. Um, and so he's like, it's it's one of the things where like Orthodox Christian lower lower O Orthodox Christianity um, was settled almost 2000 years ago, you know, but we just forget we have the same arguments over and over again because we keep asking, well, does that apply to us now? Yeah. And every generation feels like they have to ask that question. And that's the kind of question Lewis would say, there's literally no need to ask that question. That's chronologically snobbish, right? Yeah. yeah and on, on the note of, of just like questions that we're asking now that we think are unique, you know, like if, if you, you listeners out there, you know, you're listening to this podcast and and you have questions about well how how do people with different racial and ethnic backgrounds live together in a multi-ethnic country well guess what like lewis had to ask that question and and a answered it you know and so from his perspective you know you, you just said daniel like um he's not always right and that's that's just true i disagree with lewis on certain things too but it's like you know he would ask the question questions about gender he would ask questions about hierarchy and equality Mm -hmm. There were some some of the first essays that we read. We continue to reference over and over and over again because it was so challenging. Um, and and the problem is he's just so smart, so he he and articulate that he just thinks things through so so well. But you know we ask those questions like asking asking questions about about um, even you know like life on other planets. It's not just Joe Rogan. You talking about that? Like Lewis was talking about that. <laughs> yeah. So so that all that kind of stuff is is uh, is wrapped up in in what he wrote about and and honestly i mean after we're just beginning our third season i i think we're just scratching the surface i was at i was at coffee the other day with my staff and and they were they were saying like hey how, how much left do you think you have that you could go through like how many essays and i'm like i'll be doing this essay until i retire or this this podcast rather i'll yeah. be i'll be doing these essays on this sure. podcast until i retire if we continue at this pace because it's just never ending um, more content yep. to go into and then throw in the stories in the mix. You know, you guys are going through so-called children's books and, and every chapter you, I'm sure there's just so much more than you can possibly air. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We have to, we have to trim out stuff to make it consumable. Yeah. Yeah. You referenced Sean that, uh, and I'll, I'll just let our listeners know too. One of my favorite episodes y'all did, it was like the fourth or fifth one y'all did. It was on equality. It was equality, and there was one other essay you did. I, I don't remember the second essay that you'll put along with it. Yeah, probably um, probably membership, I would guess. Maybe, yeah, was, that might have been the one. That it was Two it. Ways with the Self. Oh, yeah. 
But it, we did okay. all, we did okay. equality because it tied in with membership. Yeah, yeah. E- equality is man. It's one of those tougher essays on the on the very first page of that essay, or at least on the edition that I have. It, it's you don't even get through the whole first page where Lewis says like you know um, Aristotle said some men aren't um, aren't fit to be. Uh, Ma- or some some men are only fit to be slaves, and Lewis says I agree with them, but only because I don't think there's anyone fit to be a master, right? Really, con- you yeah. know, really relatively controversial stuff. Provocative Lewis gets into on that first page, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, very provocative, okay. and um, and y'all walk through that so well. I was familiar with the essay, but it's kind of the ones that it's one of those essays that like that's not the one I'm going to introduce people to Lewis on, right? Like that might. That's right. Um, if I think you have to have a trust in Lewis already to read something provocative like that, um, and see, oh, here's what he's saying. You know, it's it's maybe actually he kind of actually softens the blow as you go further on in that essay. But you two, Sean and Jordan, did such a great job walking through that without also being polemic. I think you saw ways that equality. You even walked through some of the political kind of consequences of an essay like that and kind of pointed out where it, some kind of binary just isn't a is it's it doesn't f- coincide with the Christian faith in that way you b- you know both sides if you want to think about it that way have have failings in this regard right mm-hmm. and i think for you know your fourth or fifth episode i remember and i was listening to them as they were coming out i was like whoa these guys are the real deal like they really <laughs> are able to walk through this in a way that acknowledges the provocative nature of this, but also acknowledges the truth that's found in it too, and helped me uncover. In fact, um, I have a couple of buddies that every year we get together, we go out and get a cabin in the mountains, and uh, it's kind of, I guess, like our own little inkling thing because we'll read maybe poetry or like sing some songs together and stuff. And I read Equality this year. I felt bold enough to like read it and not um, everyone's in kind of different pa- places in their faith journey, too. So I was like, but I, I felt like y'all had given me the tools cool. to be able to like read this out loud and then have really kind of heated and lively discussion about what Lewis is saying. So I'd, it's it again, it y'all, y'all have taken those things that are still timely and it, I remember in that essay in particular, there were parts of it where you said, yeah, I actually think Lewis is wrong here. I, I think that he's mistaken here. And there are, there are parts of it that I would totally agree with in that essay. Or even if there's, you say, oh, I, I agree with him here, but man, I would not use that language because it's just going to turn people off or it's just going to, or excite people in ways that it shouldn't, mm. right? Um, mm-hmm. And really since then, y'all have only gotten better and better. And so it's been just really spectacular. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think you, you're you have more confidence in uh, us than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Those ones were there were so many in that first season that I just kept going. Oh no! Like w- I'm not the type of guy to hop on social media and give my opinion on anything going on in the world. <laughs> and so, but Lewis, what he wrote forced us to. We couldn't just not talk about it. Yeah. yeah. I'll say that I I think one of the fun things about this medium of podcasting is that we have we have a lot of people and i personally have really enjoyed listening to content while i'm doing something else but this is a this is a way to do it sounds like you're just overhearing a conversation between friends it almost feels like you're in the room and you're hanging out but it can be an entry point into stuff that may have seemed a little inaccessible so for me i grew up with mere christianity the great divorce Lots of C.S. Lewis books on the shelf, but they had really old, boring covers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to read a book called The Great Divorce. That Just the title itself made me not want to read it because it had the word divorce in it. And this is coming like, from I'm like a, a Christian a, man. Well, no, no, from <laughs> a third, I'm a third grader and I'm <laughs> oh, <you're> scared <laughs> about the concept <laughs> yeah. of divorce. Yeah. <laughs> but then, be, like, so for this show, I mean, recording it has made me read all the Chronicles of Narnia, or I'm almost done. Um, but then even just the way y'all were talking, um, I think, Jordan, you had a, an episode which was your talk on prayer and some of the things that C.S. Lewis had said about prayer. And just listening to that made me think, oh, I think that I need to check some of these things out. Because you were you were giving me maybe two or three sentences about something, and it was enough to be that entry point. And I thought, okay, now I know where to start. Now I know which 
of his gazillion essays or which of the 80 books I should start with <laughs> because of this medium that I'm listening to in the car while I'm driving, which is different than a book from, you know, 50 plus years ago Yeah, that you consume in the more traditional way of looking at ink on a page. Yeah, well, totally. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, I think we kind of hope that the podcast turns into a bit of a resource like that to at least give people an entry point into the essay. Well, like we don't assume that people have actually listened to the essay before they listen to the episode because most people just mm -hmm. won't, at least not every essay. Uh, but we do yeah. hope that it's enough so that if you remember later, something comes up and you go, I oh, Lewis must have said something about that because I remember listening to this episode about it and you can go back and find which essay it was because of, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and points for having good show notes too. Yeah. <laughs> this, there have been so many things where I'm like, wait, what are they talking about? And not not y'all specifically, but any podcast. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for, yeah, we got a link. <laughs> we have a list of links and you just click it and then you're, you're off. Yeah. Would each of y'all be willing to share your favorite or maybe just one of your favorite essays of Lewis and maybe just tell us a little bit about the background for this particular essay and what about it makes it so great? Uh, yeah, I, you, you, you warned me, you warned me that, we, and I knew I've known for days that you'd ask me this and I'm like, I, <laughs> it's so hard to answer that question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I personally, you know, we've already talked about membership and inequality, so I, I don't really want to give that answer that, but that honestly, that's the one that's, that's provoked me the most. I don't, I don't necessarily want to say it's my favorite because my wife may not love that. Um, <laughs> but just kidding. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I, I actually, I think I got to say probably membership is, uh, is, is okay. my favorite that I've, I've read or listened to so far of about 30. Can you, can, oh. would you just mind for a second, Sean? Why? Could you maybe tell us a little bit about, for someone who hasn't read yeah, it Yeah, totally. Okay, sure. Or isn't familiar with no, it. No, just tell us a little bit about membership. Membership, he, Lewis just talks about the difference. Um, he, he talks about being the body, really, of Christ and mm -hmm. what it means to be different members of one body. And so again, you might have listeners that are non-Christians. He, he goes way beyond it. And he talks about um, being um, a unit. So he, you know, he was a soldier. He, he remembers. And so he says, as a soldier, you're looking for uniformity. You wear a uniform, um, you become one thing. You're not looking for diversity in a platoon of, of uh, X number of people. And, uh, but he says, in, as a member of a body, you are looking for diversity. And, and so he talks about hierarchy and that and order and all that kind of thing. And, and that was highly provocative to me. And, and again, in, um, uh, in my leadership and my work and in my teaching and in my family life and being a father, that one has, has helped me, I think, to appreciate the different seasons and times of people. And I actually, one thing that he doesn't write about, but that it provoked in me was, was to see like people with, with uh, addictions or disabilities or other kind of um, deeply besetting issues that, that make them seem like they have quote less to contribute in a new light. Um, and then it caused mm -hmm. me to go back to Corinthians where he's referring to membership there. And, and yeah, so, so I would say that's why it's probably, I, I can't, if you ask me again in 10 minutes, I'll give you a different answer, but probably that's, membership. That's fair. That's, <laughs> that's totally fair. fair. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. How about you, Jordan? I would, uh, yeah, again, I, I can't choose, but the one that keeps coming up for me is the seeing eye, which we did near the end of our first season. And the background there is that Lewis had heard that when the Russian cosmonauts went to space, someone said, well, we've been to space and we didn't see God there. And therefore you know, God doesn't exist. And he, mm -hmm. he takes that, uh, accusation against Christianity and the greater accusation behind it, which is all these scientific developments prove, or to some people prove that Christianity isn't real or can't be real. And so it's kind of an apology against that idea but also he theorizes about space exploration and will that specifically challenge our faith? And what if there's aliens and these kind of like, what if scenarios, which is just fun to begin with, but he, he kind of ends with this idea that it all depends on the seeing eye. And if you don't see God on earth, you're not going to see God in space either. 
Hmm. But then he, as Lewis always does, he artfully like turns it around on the reader and kind of presents the question of, okay, so if you're not finding God on earth, why is that? And could it be actually because of the way you just see things and your preconceived ideas and your hmm. intellectual commitments? And is it because God's not here or because you don't see him and you're not, you're not willing to see him? And so in one way, I think it's the essay that is the looking at version of Out of the Silent Planet. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it's also the essay that's behind what he says about Uncle Andrew, that what you see depends on the type of person you are. Exactly. Yeah. That's well said. And that might be how that might be my entry point. <laughs> For no, you. Yeah, yeah. That one has piqued my interest. Yeah. And so, you know, I w- I'm shocked that you said that I. I had prepared to say that that was my favorite one. <laughs> and then in the midst of this conversation, I'm like, ah, no. And actually, I think that uh, elements of the seeing eye come up in chapter seven of The Last Battle. Yeah, I don't know if you saw great. that. You noticed that too, Jordan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have a general question. Where, what is your preferred way to consume a lesser known C.S. Lewis essay? There's that word again. Yeah. <laughs> I, it depends. I've, I've listened to, I've listened to most of them. There's an audible, uh, book you can get. That's I think 130 of the essays and they are Mm -hmm. primarily, I think we're going to get through all of them. Lord willing, if our podcast continues, that's our goal (laughs) to get through at least those ones. Okay. And it's also just convenient. Again, like you're saying, you can listen to them while you're doing anything. And then if you, want to go back and take a more thorough look through it, you can find it in print somewhere, which is what we eventually do before we record is we'll, we'll read it in a hard copy, but, um, yeah, I listen to them. Yeah. And, and to prepare for the show, I, I always listen, you can, you can find almost all of them on YouTube. Um, and they're, they're read really well. And so, so I'll listen to an essay on YouTube and then I read it after is typically what I do is, is I find two goes through and I'm not much of a, I don't like to mark up my books. Um, so I don't make marks in books. So I, I like, I, I love, but Lewis's essays just, they provoke so much. So I, uh, I like to be able to physically write on something. So I listen to one and write on, um, read and write on the other. Okay. And are you, is this, you said a physical book or are you printing them out or? Yeah, I kind of, sometimes I print them. Um, yeah. I do have a physical copy of the audible one. It's uh, it's called C.S. Lewis Essay Collection, Faith, Christianity, okay. and the Church. And that's got the 130 that I was referring to. Uh, but there's like smaller anthologies of them uh, okay. in just various forms. Yeah, yeah. famously God in the Dock is, uh, is yeah. probably one of the most well-known ones. One, well-known, lesser-known okay. sources. <laughs> <laughs> there's quite a few that are harder to come by. I know that uh, maybe I mentioned this already on the show, Phil, I can't remember, but um, when I finished my master's, my wife got me, uh, they asked for a paper, mm. which is one that was actually published during Lewis's lifetime, uh, but is not published anymore. It's a lot of those essays are just found in other places now. And she got it from a library, like used from a library in England, which was like mm. the coolest thing. Mm-hmm. Wow. And it's been really fun. I, I am. I can't imagine what they fines on that are going to be (laughs) 300 years of back taxes and and you didn't return a library i am the opposite of sean where i destroy my books i write all over them i fold pages do everything but this this book i'm just like it's pristine Uh, i mean it's it's not actually pristine but i'm keeping it as close to pristine as i can not writing in that one but um yeah there's a lot of really cool ones out there so before we head out, would y'all be able to tell us where can listeners find y'all's show? Where can they listen to you at? Yeah, we can be found, I think, on pretty much any podcast. Everywhere, app. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I upload it through the Spotify one, and it's on Apple and Google okay. and whatever. other. Every time I, I find out about these new podcast apps, every time someone says what they listen to, sure. Podbean, that's a thing, I guess. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, we have a, we have a webpage um, – which is just pintswithjack.com slash LKL. David was uh, kind enough to put us up there. Yeah, so that's, that's great. great. You can find more about us there. And we have a Patreon. So that's where we're at. Oh, we have Instagram and Facebook too. We're, okay. we're, yeah, we're everywhere. Nice. Yeah. See, it's, it's one of those questions. It feels weird at first, but then there are a lot of places yeah. that we can actually find you at. Yeah. So that's great. Is there a, 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 
certain phrase that's the easiest to find you if someone's going to search? If they just search Lesser Known Lewis, will that get, get right to y'all? I think that turns up all our podcasts and maybe some Perfect. of our social media. Yeah. Cool. Great. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for having this conversation with us. Thank you for sharing not only about what y'all do on the show, but allowing us to talk a little bit more about some of these essays. And I know a lot of our listeners are going to be excited to join y'all as you go through all of these lesser known works. Thanks so much for having us. This was so much fun and can't wait to do it again next week. Yeah. See you then. This episode is made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com. If you'd like to support the show, you can listen to a bonus episode each month along with other special rewards. The special thanks goes out to John Marr, Emily Wakefield, and Ryan Smith for supporting us at our very top tiers. If you have any listener feedback, you can email us at thenarniapodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 406-646-6733. You can find all of our previous episodes, links, and book information at lamppostlistener.com. We would appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts because this helps other listeners find the show and join together in our read-through. Thank you for joining us on this journey, and we'll be back next time 